get started then. Uh, welcome everyone in, uh, to this uh, virtual version of the Humanities Institute at Stony Brook. I am Adrián Pérez Melgosa, the Institute Director, and I would like to extend the warmest welcome to uh, our speaker today, music, music producer, music composer, musician, Jay Lin. And before introducing today's event, I would like to remind everyone of the and today Upcoming. will be introduced by Professor Judith Lockhart and Professor Benjamin Tosig, both from the English department. And both are teaching the classes that are uh, thinking and uh, questioning and also researching on, on, this, uh, on this music. And this event is very special because it's really student driven in a lot of uh, ways. And uh, it will be in conversation with Jalen. So it is my pleasure now to pass the virtual microphone to Professor Judith Lockhart and Professor Benjamin Tausig, who will coordinate the rest of the event. Thank you, everyone, and welcome. Thank you, Adrian. Um, and just just remind we're from the music department. <laughs> oh, what did I say? <laughs> you said English. So oh, sorry. Make that clear. <laughs> uh, yeah, from the music department, of course. Um, as, uh, as, so anyway, as, it's a great pleasure to be here and to, to welcome Jalen to this event. Um, we've been looking forward to this for a long time. Um, uh, as Adrian has uh, said, that this is in conjunction with two classes that are being taught at present in the music department, and that is my class, which is uh, Music 109, Rock, Popular Music, and Society. And we've been studying uh, variety of musics and and last week we spent a good amount of time studying Jalen's uh, really important contributions to electronic music um, and so we've been what we've done is we've gotten students to get together and be the spokespeople for the two classes and they will be asking questions the other class is by Ben Tausig and this is a graduate class in the music department um, and he'll say a little bit about his class and other than that, it's going to be students asking questions um, for their colleagues and for themselves. And we really do want them to be leading the, the conversation here. So now I'll just turn it over to Ben Tausig, who will tell a little bit about his class and other, some other things. Thank you so much, Judy, and thanks for your part in organizing this. Thanks to Adrian and Adrian as well. Uh, so my course is a graduate class, um, which includes DMAs, MAs, um, and we focus on sex and bodies in electronic music and Jalen's work represents something of an apex of the semester for us. Uh, we've been talking all semester long about how the body and identity have been figured through particular electronic sounds or compositional practices, uh, whether those are the instruments of house music or Detroit techno, the experimentation of Prince or South African studio producers in the 1990s. And in Jalen's work, we hear ideas that, at least to me, connect very squarely with the genealogy of house music, uh, but that also suggests some really lovely and radical experimental possibilities from rhythm to timbre to the kind of world building that uh, is so much a part of her albums in particular. So it's a real honor to have her here and to be able to speak with her. Uh, and with that, I want to turn it over for a formal introduction to two of the graduate students in our class. Kate Amrine and Rubens de la Corte, who will introduce Jalen. Take it away. Go ahead, Kate and Rubens, if you want to unmute yourselves. Just waiting for Kate. Why don't you go ahead and start, Rubens, and then... Sure. Uh, my name is Rubens de la Corte. I'm a second uh, year ethnomusicology graduate student with research interests in organology and its intersections with gender, sexuality, immigration, and minorities. I have been listening to both Black Origami and Dark Energy. I have also listened to Little Black Book, uh, Jay's Leufny, uh, The Reimagining of uh, Beethoven's Fifth, and Arise in My Senses. Um, Jaylene uh, began producing music in 2008 with the track Erotic Heat, followed by the well-acclaimed album Dark Energy in 2015. Her second full-length album, Black Origami, released in 2017, was considered among the year's electronic top 10 by the Rolling Stone, Spin, and Pitchfork. In 2019, 
In 18, Jaylene wrote Autobiography, a music and dance collaboration with renowned British choreographer Wayne McGregor. From expanding the footwork genre's limits to reinforcing the path for women in the still male-dominated electronic music scene, Jaylene continues to produce and map new grounds for electronic music. All right, so hi everyone. We're so excited to welcome Jaylin. My name is Kate Amrine and I am a doctoral student here in the Sex Bodies and Electronic Music class. I'm a trumpet player. And we had a really great time last week reviewing Jalen's music. So I'm really, really excited for today's conversation. I really loved listening to Black Origami and I'm so excited to check out everything else that you've done, Jalen. So I know this is gonna be a really great conversation and thank you so much for joining us. Oh my goodness, thank you all so much. I'm, wow, <laughs> thank you. Wow, what an intro. That was really, 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 it's, it's very sweet. I'm so thankful. So I'm very, I'm delighted to be here with everybody, truly. And thank you to everybody that made this possible. Let me first start off by saying that, because I don't want you to think I'm rude. Um, <laughs> but thank you, honestly, truly to everybody who has made this possible. It has been, um, quite the journey for everyone, which is why we're, of course, all on Zoom and not in person. But, I, you know, we've all, um, we're here and, you know, we're all, we're all supposed to be here. So, you know, we all continue this fight every day and some days we get beat up and some days it's a draw. <laughs> But, you know, it's it's beautiful. It's all a part of everybody's journey. And then again, I'm just so, so grateful to be here. Thank you. So I think the first question is going to come from a student in my class. Her name is Gabby Rosenblum. So Gabby, go ahead. Hi, Jalen. Uh, my name is Gabby. Um, I really like your music. I've actually listened to a lot ever since uh, we heard that you're coming to our school. So my first question is, what tends to be the most challenging part of producing a song? Ooh, um, I, uh, that can change daily. Some days, it is rarely for me is it seamless, but the I would say the most challenging thing in producing a song is when you know something's there, but you're having a block or there's the distraction of, lately for me, it's been kind of like the distractions of life. Like I know we have a project sitting inside of you and then it's like, okay, but everything around you is happening and kind of keeping you, you know, keeping me from doing it. And um, you want to write and then you have, you know, there's writer's block, of course, everybody's favorite thing. Yeah, right. And, you know, so it's it's that, you know, for me, those are my my, usually my biggest challenges of um, also sometimes even, this is a rare one, but sometimes I kind of dive in deep and then too too deep and then I can't hear where I was to then, you know, go where I want to. So those are some of my challenges. Um, Gabby, if, if you want to follow up with anything, feel free. Have you experienced any particular challenges like during COVID? Have um, has any of your music kind of been inspired by what's going on during the pandemic? Um, I'm sure in some way indirectly, maybe I wouldn't say like yes. I've just I've been pulling from the state of COVID, but I would say just maybe probably indirectly, um, just having to. Um, you know, the the process of having to reinvent, readjust, you know, myself as an artist and, you know, still in the process, transitioning process of um, um, just one thing to another, having to get used to, you know, you know, everything, as you all know, you know, everything, performance has stopped, everything just kind of just came to a dead stop. I hadn't been on the road since last March of um, 2020. And it's, it's been, you know, it was just, it was hectic. Um, and like it was just, it was just such a change of life. So um, the good thing about that was for me is that I, I love composition. I love writing music more than I love performing. So it was kind of, it was, it was a, you know, it was, it was a sweet and sour thing. So I just, I wrote a lot. I wrote a lot. I have, a, I have, I probably have, Ooh, now probably about three albums worth of material. Now, what that means, like as far as having, like putting an album together, do I any of those three 
album's worth of material. No, I'm, I wouldn't not right now. I wouldn't put that out because I have another project I'd like to do. But yeah, I hope. Sorry, I just totally went on a tangent. <laughs> That's what these things are for, tangents, right? <laughs> so I think our next uh, question will come from another student from my class. His name is Chris Jean. And Hi, Chris. So, go ahead, Chris. Hey, thank you for having me. <laughs> it's on. Um, I just have three questions. This one's before I jump into the music stuff, you know. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I jumped into I jumped into like reading some stuff about you beforehand. And I saw mm -hmm. I said that you did math at Purdue for a little mm -hmm. while. Mm. See me, I could never. So that's that's on you. Well, I was just like, did you have like a career in mind before you got into music? Like, did you want it or just like you just went for math or anything? No. Okay. So the truth is, when I first started my whole the whole college, you know, for me, it was I, I really what I really wanted to do is I thought I was going to be an Egyptologist. So that was my first thing. Like I actually was I was very I've never even talked about this in an, like ever before. So I thought I was going to be an Egyptologist um cuz I was so obsessed with Egypt. Like I was just like I'm just going to be I know this is what I want to do. And then for me then it got like okay this isn't realistic right now. So then it was like well I have to go to school for something. And I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I I really didn't. I I I kind of got I was kind of thrown into the lion's den um, by the, which was my own doing. It wasn't, you know, like you, know, my parents, like you have to go to school. Like it wasn't anything like that. It was just by my own doing and the pressures, I guess, of society, to, you know, go to school, get a good job, go to school, get a good job, you know? So it was like, okay, yeah, let's, let's do that part. And um, I ended up, um, I've always, I've loved math. Um, up until I, it started when I, I would say when I was a, probably a sophomore in high school because I had a teacher named Miss Lee who just believed in me so much and she opened my eyes in the way I would problem solve. And so what, what ended up happening was is I would solve problems. I could solve a problem backwards and forwards. So then the, I, when I got, by the time I got into trig, which was a, a lot of proofing, I was like, oh, my mind's already trained to do this. So you can give me the answer and now I have to figure out the question. So it was like musically to go into musically, that's, uh, that's a lot of what, I, of what I do. It's either here's the question, what's the answer or here's the answer what's the question and musically that's very how i think about things in terms of like creating um and the question's never the same and the answer's never the same so and and that's what make each like each of my songs their own they're like my kids they're their own personalities own well they're not like my kids they are my kids like their own personalities and own um you know, different attitudes, different feelings, you know, and that that's just kind of how that went with the whole, you know, with me and math. And then I got to Purdue and um, I didn't finish. And um, had I realized at the time that I, I, if I had done, if I could have done it differently, which I wouldn't, because I probably wouldn't be me um, now, I would have, but I would have maybe back then majored in math and then that was it then it would have been a lot more broad and all that fun stuff. But no, I, I the way that I did it is as crazy and as crooked as it is as it was. Um I landed here. So, you know, I like T.I. has a saying, he says, I'm right even when I'm on the wrong road. So I I I, I felt him when he said that. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I expect that you said the first time you ever talked about it. I feel so special now. Oh, yeah. That's the first time I've ever talked about that. A <laughs> next question was, like you said, um, when you like you switched over to like music, that's why you didn't like you dry, um, got out of school and everything. Did mm. you know how to make like music a while before that? Or it's like while you were in there, you picked it up and then it just became like second nature kind of. It was, it, 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 and I picked it up and it became a very love-hate relationship. That's how it started. It's like, I hate this thing, but I, I have to do this thing. Like I breathe because I loved it, but I hated it because I was in the, you know, you're in your first stage of developing process. And then you, you know, it took me, it took me, I would say about maybe three or four years to find my signature musically, but, and then finding your signature, it, you know, some 
musicians feel like when you find once you find your signature that's it for me it was like no once you find your signature there's the start now you start now we've opened up you've opened up your whole world so for me it was very um it wasn't second nature and um thank god it wasn't um <laughs> because it, if i think if it was second nature i would have become complacent very early and i don't like i love when I'm not complacent because it makes me have to dig in spaces that are rough. And then to me, that gets my best work. It's like, I have the, I, I look at it like a diamond when you, when it's a piece of coal, nobody's paying attention, you know, it's a piece of coal. And then all of a sudden there's the just infinite amount of pressure. And then there's this diamond. I, I, I look at it the same way. And um, that's with all of, you know, like that's with all of my work that's out now what will happen in the future, that's that's the process in which I work. It's always the coal and then the pressure hits and, you know, strikes and it's, it's overwhelming sometimes. And then boom, there's an album or there's a song, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And like you said, the, my last question is, you kind of referenced it. Oh yeah, Kate's gonna go right to me. Um, wait, Kate, do you wanna give your question now? kind of piggybacks off the question that you just did I was just wondering I heard you say that it took you years to find your signature style what kind of inspired that like what was the process like like you know how did you find that I think finding your signature requires that you have to shut everything out at least I did I shut everything out so I stopped listening to music I stopped I didn't want I didn't want to hear anybody else's work and say let me I just shut everything out. And, I'm, and when my mother asked me the question, um, I, when I was sampling at the time, and I was with, you know, I'm sure you guys probably have seen in the interviews when I sampled um, Tina Marie's Portuguese Say Love. And she told me, she said, that's it's great. You know, but what do you sound like? And then that's what I, I wanted to know. What, yeah, what do I sound like? So I just, I shut everything out. I said, no, what do I sound like? And in order to find that out, yeah, cut everything off. Cut That's it really off. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll go on to um, somebody from Ben's class. Sure. No? We have a question from uh, Gabrielle Vicens, a graduate student in Music 536. Go ahead, Gabrielle. Cool. Hey, hi, Jaylene. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. And Thank I really you. like your work. I, I've been listening to Black Origami, and I find it fascinating and refreshing. Um, so I have three questions. I guess one of them you already kind of talk about it, uh, which is the one at the, like I heard in an interview that you talk about that your mom is the one who who challenged you to find your own voice. This is basically what you just said. Mm. Um, and I guess my question with this is like the process of I'm not gonna even read it. I think I I, I got it. So the process of uh, what you were doing before, from what you were doing before to then finding your your voice like uh is that something that that happened organically uh you know it happens very naturally like or or did it, did it take you like a while to to from one place to the other one oh uh, yeah it took a while i mean and it's still see that the biggest thing in, in in doing that and finding a signature you have to first hurdle number one trust yourself <laughs> mm. and that takes a while and that's a that is a constant thing. Um, it, it doesn't stop, you know. Like, oh, okay, I trust myself. No, one time and that's it. No, it's it's a, it's a constant thing mm -hmm. um, because I have had to. Um, I realized probably that was a thing when I heard Beyonce say the exact same thing about. I think it was her album for B Day, and um, her label was like at that time was like this isn't going to sell. And then it goes platinum six times. Like, and then, yeah, you sometimes when you, it, 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 I'm just very much a person that believes that when you see it, and I've also been in positions like that before where there was an artist, I give you, um, I can't share the person's name, but I was going to collaborate with this particular artist and everybody told me that, you know, the, what it, the collaboration ended up not working. And everybody's like, you should wait, you know, to put out Black Origami, you know, maybe you and this artist can do something else. And I was like, I'm not waiting on this artist. And they were like, but I said, if, if this was 
you know, President Barack Obama, I'm not waiting. Like, I'm just, I'm just not. Sometimes you have to, and that takes a tenacity, which takes some time, it takes time. And it's not that you, it's not arrogant. It's, it's, there's a difference. It's not arrogant, but when you know your work and you know yourself, and that is personal, that's not professional. You have to deal with the personal of you first. Then you step into the professional because see your personal rolls into your professional, not the other way around. Um, you have to know yourself and that cannot involve the validation of other people. I, I just, it just, it just can't, it can't because the moment you, you're looking for the validation of, of, I create because I love it. I have to, it's who I am. It's like breathing. It's like being black for me. I have to create. So this has nothing to do with anybody else. It's great, of course. And I'm so grateful when, other, when people love my work but I'm creating because that's who I am, not because that's what I, yes, it is what I do, but it's who I am. And I know that. And so I operate in that and I have to be responsible and accountable for the things I put out in the atmosphere because I do have a gift. So all of that weighs in uh, and, and it's crucial, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Okay. I thank you. Um, I have mm -hmm. two more questions. Uh, the second one is, uh, that I feel that a lot of music, uh, electronic music, relies on repetition, uh, which mm -hmm. is something I like. Uh, I mean, I like repetition or not, I, I, something that I like. But uh, my question is that I, I, after I listen to your music a while, I, I, I find that something really cool is that even though there's repetition, of course, um, there's also parts that are, are more uh, are developing. Right, there's constantly changing, and this creates kind of like a like interesting, uh, like there's always a kind of a tension happening. Uh, it is something that you um, this this topic of like having having a section that is repetitive and having other sections that are constantly evolving is something that you think uh, is, is part of your process. Um, and also, do you do you think about improvisation? When you uh, when you work in your music, is it part of your of your language of your style? Every time I create, every time I create, that's why people call me Jalen the Innovator because imp improvising is crucial <laughs> to what to to me. the way that I work is crucial. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a three a, a three trick pony that I operate in when I you know write, and that's clean, precise, and unpredictable. Um, that I just call CPU um, and. I just, I, I operate in that because I love when shifts happen. To me, when I hear a song and I hear the buildup happening, to me, nothing worse. It's no disrespect to anyone, I swear. But like when I hear a song happening, it's like the drop's about to happen and then boom, the drop really does happen. And I'm like, oh no, I'm, I'm disappointed. <laughs> versus, <laughs> versus like, it's like, you know, it's like that dun, 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 dun. Oh, dang, they really did drop it. Oh, okay. And then, so it's like, I'm looking, you know, I'm, I'm very much for me. So I always, I'm kind of like, I'm thinking the opposite, like, okay, I don't know. I don't want you to know where I'm going to switch. You know, it's right. just like, Ooh, there's a switch. Ooh, God. I would, you know, I mean, sometimes I'll go back and listen to a thing and surprise myself. And I think, I feel like to me, that's a, that's a, that's a moment of that's, um, a priceless moment for me as the person who created it. And it's like, Ooh, God, I surprised myself. You know, it, right. even in something that's old, you know, you can hear your, you can go back and you can hear and it's like, oh, I can hear my growth, you know, and it's, it's, it's rewarding. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, that's something I really like that, about your music that, uh, that is sometimes, it's a question, right? You're like, you're always like, okay, this is, where it is going? Like, it's very yeah, interesting. I have no idea where, right. usually I love, I love that I have no control over anything I create. I mm. am really just the vessel that it comes through. I have, when people ask me, they're like, so what are you going to do? And I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean it because I don't know. Um, it just, you know, they're like, so how, how's this going to work? And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm a spectator like you, even though I'm the one that's making it. But I'm truly, I, I have no idea. But I love that I don't have that control. Right, I right. love that, you know, that I don't have a blueprint or, you know, here is the step one, step two, step three. No, like I, I don't, I couldn't, I couldn't create that way. And right. I love that I don't. Yeah. That's beautiful. That's, that's great. Uh, my, my last question is basically about the, 
So I I, I like uh, Basinski. I like his music. Uh, for a while, I've been listening to his music, and yes, I like that he's. Uh, I just like music that is very like uh, spacey and, mm. and soft, you know, and and just a little bit of like mysterious and mm -hmm. and. Um, so when I before I heard Holy Child, I I actually was reading the liner notes and uh and I was like oh oh wow this there's a song with him and I was this is gonna be interesting this is gonna be beautiful because I find that your music is there's a lot of percussion and it's very uh, energetic and then you have this other person that is it's it works more with space and like more uh, like textures and I just want to know like your uh, uh, your uh, experience working together and and your process your process of working with him uh, if there's anything you want to say like oh yeah, yeah like i first of all i love billy i love <laughs> uh, I, I love billy or as everybody sir william basinski I, I love yeah <laughs> i call billy i love billy um billy just gave me a shot like it was so funny we had done a, the bro um, museum show together. So this was maybe back in 17. And he, like, we just were like magnets, like the first time we met. And he was just like the coolest person. And it's like, he's like the, the rock star in the whole thing. So, and mm -hmm. I didn't even realize what was happening. Mm -hmm. Everybody was like following him around. And, you know, it was, it was the craziest thing. And then it's so funny because it came, like, it, when it, it was time for me to perform. Like his performance was outside and mine was inside. And I saw him, um, I saw his performance and I was just like, oh my God. So I went outside to watch him then. I didn't even know he was gonna like come upstairs to watch me perform and he did. and right after the show he grabs me gives me a kiss on the cheek and said we got to talk and i said okay nice. and um he's he, he says here's my number call me when you get home i said okay and so i call and he's like we got it you know we, we're gonna do we're gonna do you know we have to do a song and i said absolutely i was on board as soon as he said it so he's like i'm gonna just send you some things that i just got lying around and i want you to you know put your magic on it and then send it back so I did. He basically, I, he basically did me the way um, he trusted me the way uh, Holly Herndon trusted me or, or trust me, mm. and I did that. And I created um, Holy Child. I remember sending it back. I was so scared, and I sent it back. And um, he sends me a text. He's like, "Call me right now." So I call him, and he was just like, "I don't know what you did or how you pulled this out of this." He's like, "Wow." <laughs> and, so, and so he's like you're going to put this on your album and it was at the time i was working on black origami and i was actually writing autobiography and, and um auto, and black origami at the same time mm -hmm. and yeah and which i would suggest i would tell anybody don't ever do that um and i, I did that um and he was just like this has to go on your album i said oh absolutely and then that's how it ended up happening it was he just he saw me perform he heard my music and he was just like i've never heard an artist just go at it like that right. and that's mm -hmm. how we ended up yeah that's and really cool thank you yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for the for the for the answer answer oh questions. yeah of course thank you thank you for coming and being here for the question thank you so much so and now we're going to turn to two more people from um my undergrad class and the first one is tony hi tony hi jalen hi <laughs> um i was actually i was wondering how music comes to you if you dream music how you get your ideas if there's a special place that inspires you but just how it comes to you um oh my goodness i think it depends it's it it it, it really depends on what mood i'm in so like some there are some days i just sit on a computer and i'm going through like it's just like particular sounds i may be going through sounds in a a VST or like an Omnisphere or um, let me see, Serum or something like that. Or, um, and I'm just kind of going through sounds and then something strikes me and it's like this priceless moment. It's like time stops, like, oh, ooh, where, where can I go with that? <laughs> it's like that. So that's why I say I never know what's going to happen because every, it, it all starts off as like, okay, it's like a cook, like, ooh, that tastes good. Now let's see if I mix that you know, 
<laughs> how does that how would that taste? You know, it's kind of like that for me, which is why I never know how the thing's gonna come out. Um, because it's always a new recipe, I guess. And it, that's how it comes. I, I me really just sitting in the, you know, sitting in this chair that I'm sitting in right now and um or wherever I'm at, you know, because sometimes I have to take the, you know, the studio with me and um that's how it starts. It's just like, you know, it it really just kind of having to pull from in, in a very, very, very wide open space. Um, and sometimes it's, 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 it's great. Or sometimes I could be working on something for eight hours. And then I'm like, you know what, I, I'm, I'm going to call it quits for the day. And then the last 10 minutes of that eight hours, it's like, oh, there it is. Oh my God. Control save, control save. <laughs> like, you know, because you don't want to lose the project, which I've done before. I have to, I've actually had to make a track from memory before. It was no joke. Um, Carbon 12, in fact, the track Carbon 12 that's on autobiography, I had to make from memory because I lost it at first. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's horrible. It was. But you know what? It actually came out better than the first time. Probably because you're getting new ideas as it was happening. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I of also course. wanted to know, I saw that you were an admirer of Coco Chanel. Yes. And you said that you get your idea for taking something simple and making it complex from her. Yes. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Um. Yeah, like I just, I felt like something as simple as a little black dress is very complex. Like I just, you know, I just find it to be just like something that just is really that simple. Um. I find, I mean, this this had to really have anything to do with her, but just like, I look at the way one woman can wear a fedora versus the way another woman can wear a fedora and they look totally different, but it can be the same mm -hmm. fedora, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, musically, I think the same way. It's like, um, recently, I, I would say the, 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 to, to make a comparison between the two mm -hmm. and would be who could really master that was me and my mother were talking about it was Ashford and Simpson. They took three, there were three different versions of the same song and they were in with three different artists they, that they wrote mm -hmm. and it was all, they were all number ones. Same song, just different mm -hmm. versions. Same two writers, Ashford and Simpson. And made three different versions. They were all number one hits. Like mm -hmm. that to me is that, oh God, wow. What gene, that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's what I mean. Like I think musically, um, when I say I want to take something very simple and make it complex is, you know, that goes to me, it's like mathematically, if I, if you, if you look in terms of like, I guess, permutation and combination of a number, mm -hmm. you know, like the combination of, of how many times you can make six or how many times you can make three, you know, mm -hmm. and for me, it's just like one, it's like one big math problem. <laughs> It's just really like, and it's, and it's a different problem every time, but it, not problem in a bad way, but just like, Ooh, I'm going to solve this mm -hmm. for, you know, and there's no right answer. It's just like, this is today's version of that mm -hmm. answer. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's there, like, there's a track, um, of Guantanamo, which is on, I think what album is that on? I want to say that's on dark energy. Um, and there's actually, there are actually three different versions of that song, but nobody's only ever heard just the second version. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you know, I, 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 that's what I mean. Just, you can just really just take like the simplest things and really just mm -hmm. make them, you know, as complex as you want them. Or you could take something very complex and then make it very simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really fascinating. Cause I feel like a lot of music, musically inclined people or, or artistic people are not mm -hmm. math people. So mm -hmm. the way that you kind of think of it as a problem mm -hmm. and then dissect it from there is just really fascinating. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just, <laughs> or it's just extremely nerdy, whichever one. <laughs> I want to look at it. <laughs> uh, um, and my last question was just, what inspired you to get into music? Was was there? I mean, I know you were talking a little bit about your childhood and how you always loved music, but mm -hmm. um, was there anything specifically that you heard one day or a specific artist that just made you go, "I have to do this now"? No, I was completely. To be honest with you, I was I was running away from myself. I was afraid mm -hmm. of what I could, like most people, you're afraid of your own success. Mm -hmm. You really are. And that's a rest, like that being a real, real thing. And there are times that I still very much am. 
Um, and, um, but I was running from myself. So like when I dropped out of school, you know, and I, and I didn't finish, I was very much, I had hit this very big transition point of my life where I was, I was really just running away from me as Mm -hmm. a person because I wasn't happy. One, I wasn't happy with myself. I had low self-esteem. It was just a whole thing. Mm-hmm. And I'm running away from myself, not even realizing that I'm running to myself. I didn't know that at the time. And um, the, you know that everybody knows the quote, one often meets his destiny on the road he takes to avoid it. And that is exactly what I was doing. <laughs> That's exactly what <laughs> happened. Yes. So <laughs> avoiding myself to find myself is mm-hmm. that's how I started musically. Um, and, but th- there is an artist, um, probably one but one of my favorite artists um um Sade for sure but when I was studying um I, I I was watching I'm obsessed every time I get to see one I'm I'm obsessed um like like it watching Igor Stravinsky do a rehearsal is mm-hmm. the most fascinating thing I've ever seen that man literally sound check looked like it was for 12 hours because he used to go through every single instrument one by one not by section by mm. instrument literally mm. so every drum every trumpet everybody and he tuned everybody's everything and then rehearsal started mm-hmm. like i wow <laughs> your your hearing his, his hearing had to be impeccable so you know i just I love things like that. And those are the kind of the moments that, you know, when I get down and then I think about those kind of things and that's what shape kind of, you know, those kind of things shape me to like to keep going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, it's so very nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you too. <laughs> <laughs> one, one, I know one of the questions from my class had to do with Sade and I can't remember, Melody, is that one that you were going to? a raise or what but you're up next so go for oh. it oh oh uh oh okay <laughs> hi Jalen. how are hi. you i'm nice good to you. Meet you nice to um, meet you too okay so i have two questions um one of my questions is um uh is there any artist in the electronic industry that you would like to collaborate with that you could think of i know i'm that putting I you on the spot oh my goodness <laughs> that i can think of right now um offhand oh my god is it bad to say no <laughs> no not no, at all no it's probably no i just um i that i can think of solid you know what no i take that back there is one and she and i we, we're gonna do it we talk about it all the time we need to do it um it's a more mother we need to do it um <laughs> We, yeah, me and Kame, we need to, we need to collaborate. Um, We're going to, I just, um, we just have to put the time together to do it. Cause I know she's working on, I think she's doing a residency right now, but um, yeah, it it would definitely happen. Uh, Me and, me and Kame, me and more, me and more, sorry, I'm using her name. Uh, More mother, we, we definitely, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, I'm excited to hear that in the future. Thank um, you. <laughs> Me too, because I have no idea what that even sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's gonna be great, so don't Thank don't worry. Thank you. And um, my second question is, um, where do you see yourself in five years' time? Like maybe a little, you know, a little Grammy here, you know. Ooh, um, I see myself pulling all of the HBCU bands together and having them at festivals because we're long overdue. <laughs> this is that's so long overdue. Um, getting I want I want I want the black bands to they've made such an impact musically and they haven't gotten it just due and I think they should. Okay. Thank you so much for answering my questions. You're welcome. So wow, this is a very fortuitous moment to introduce Kevin Newton. Uh, who in fact has a couple of questions, including one about HBCU marching bands. So I turn it over okay. to Kevin. Okay. Go ahead, Kevin. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Thank you. So I'll save that question uh, for a second because I, I think you actually just kind of answered it in a way. Um, okay. But my first question, 
my first question is actually you're talking about loving the idea of the diamond mm. and um which brings me back to a fascination that I developed in listening to Black Origami with the, the titles of the songs uh, that in particular connects to Kyanite and like calcination. And um, I wondered, uh, I, I see in the titles of the songs intersections between like spiritualism, in particular global perspectives on uh, spiritualism, um, also science uh, as they pertain to like ideas of like discovery um, perhaps like self-discovery as, you, as you've talked about. Um, mm. And it, it made me wonder, uh, is there a through line narrative that you've created with the titles of the songs or do they, do, do they exist autonomously? Because I'm fascinated with the order that they, they appear in in particular. Mm, um, well, I'm very much a person that, I mean, before I even do it, it would, every album I've ever done, I've had some research before I did it. So it was, you know, and research for one, for just a, of me, knowledge for, knowledge for myself. And then also I had to study me and where I was at that time in the process of, you know, creating or titling. Titling is the hardest for me. It's not, most people, it, you know, you would, you would think like, okay, well, well the, the hard part's over. You've made the song. And it's like, no, the, the title because you have to listen for me I have to listen to that thing that I just made and it's like you can't just throw any title on there like I at least I can't I can't I'm not I mean people can but I, I don't because I have to, I'm responsible because that is what every time you say that name it's reverberating in the atmosphere and I being the artist have to be responsible for that so I'm very meticulous and very um I'm very, um, you know, always thinking what is the best title for this piece. There's many pieces. I'll be honest with you for Black Origami. I had to, I think it was six or seven tracks. I had to go back and name um, because they were, they had no titles and it took a while. It took, almost took a month because I had to go and the song had to tell me what it was called. You know, and it, it, so I, I wrote it, but, the, but it, the song introduced itself to me, you know, and not to sound crazy, but it, it kind of did. It don't sound crazy. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow, that's, that's really beautiful. Thank you. Um, and so then my, my second question, which, I, which you may have already answered, mm -hmm. um, was in reference in particular actually to the song Challenge. I mean, throughout the, mm. throughout the album, there's a lot of sounds that resonate with my experiences as a kid. Um, all, a lot of my family members went to HBCUs. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was at those football games. And of course, you know, the marching band is the thing. Yeah, halftime um, is game time. Right, yeah, nobody's yeah. watching the game. But, yeah, uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, but yeah, so in particular, on that, on that track, I thought it was the most obvious. Of course, it's like, you know, you have these sounds, the snare and the bass drum and the whistle and the, the loud voice. Um, and all of these things connect with that experience for me. And, and then also with the track title, just creating an atmosphere, an oppositional kind of atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm not lost on the fact that a lot of those sounds are um, innate to footwork. Um, mm -hmm. But I wanted to ask you what those sounds mean to you and why, why those sounds? Um, because it's very, it's, 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 you know, to me, for me, and what I, what I have lived, to be Black for me is such a privilege. And musically, and then to on top of then be musically inclined and be black and to walk in the rhythm that I know we are and then be able to then audibly put it out in the world, I'm, I have to honor my gift. I, I have to just honor my gift. That's, that, that's, that's the best I can put it. I have to honor the gift because it is a code of honor and I have to honor my gift. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, two more from uh, two from our undergraduates. 
And I will start with Lucas. Hey, Jalen. Hi, Lucas. Thank you so much for answering all the questions. Your answers have been fascinating so far. Oh, thank you. So uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about was the cover art for Black Origami. Mm. So I just wanted to know like where you got the inspiration for it and like what the symbolism or hidden meanings behind it are. Because elephant is so, the elephant is so majestic, it's such a, the elephant is such a majestic um, animal, species. And I wanted, First of all, it was so funny because when I first told my label, I was like, this is what I want. I want an origami elephant on the cover. And they were like, wait, huh? How are we? <laughs> it was like, <laughs> wait, what? Okay. So after they said, okay, Jalen. Oh, okay. You know, I'm pretty sure they thought I was like massively weird. But um, it, yeah, it, it just, it went, you know, they went and found an, an origami artist who made the um, the elephant and... I, it was beautiful. I, oh my goodness. That first, like, I, I remember the artist, I forgot her, I forgot, I forgot her name, but she was very, um, she was just so good at what she did, what she does. And then when I saw it, like, she's like, these are the trials. I'm like, no, this is it. Like, no, 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 no trial. This is it. That's it right there. And then with the whole like metallic grays over it, I thought, you know, I was like, this is that that's that's the album cover right there. Just that simple. That's it. <laughs> it was like that. First take was the best take. First take was the best take. Uh, first take is usually to me always usually the best take. Because mm -hmm. first take is always is very vulnerable. That's the best take. Interesting. It's it's good to know. Uh one other thing I wanted to ask you about was earlier you said you were you had three albums worth of unreleased material. Mm. And like, as a music fan, that's kind of frustrating to me because it's like when there are artists that I listen to that don't release music, mm -hmm. like when they have it, mm. it's like, come on, just drop the album already. We want to hear it. Mm. Like, what's the process for releasing an album? Like, is it a perfectionist thing where if it's like, it's not perfect, you don't want to release it or is it something else? Oh, God. No, for me, well, I can't answer, of course, for um, for every artist, but I know for me, no, it's, I'm not, I'm never looking for perfection ever. I like sufficient, but not perfection because perfection for me is very much when you do it to, when it's, when it's, when perfection is the goal for me, I think it, it creates a facade that I don't want in my music because I want the person who's listening to hear my vulnerability and lit hearing me expose myself musically, but being vulnerable, you know, because their person's vulnerable listening to it. So for me, when I create, there's a project that has been inside of me for three years that I've been avoiding. And that's the, that's the one that's gonna be the album, not the one, um, the songs that I have, you know, that I've made. I mean, it's, it's, they're, they're nice, they're, they're good, you know, but that's not what I'm looking for. The one that I want out is the one that I'm scared to make. It, the one, that's the one I'm going for. Not the one that's easy that I can say, let me collect these songs and make an album. That, oh, that part's easy, but that's not Jalen the artist. Jalen the artist is to always go with make, where, what makes her uncomfortable. And for me, being comfortable is being uncomfortable. So, that's the album I'm going for, not the one that I can just snatch down and say, oh, yeah, here are 12 songs. There you go. There's an album. That's easy. You know, so I, I'm like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. OK, Sayla, you're up. Hi, Jalen. Hi. For being here. Um, my first question is, I think you said in one of your interviews that uh, you don't know how to play any instruments. No. Did that ever get in the way of your career? No. Mm -mm. Because, yeah. no, because I can, I can hear. Um, I can, I, my ears, you know, I just, I can hear and I can, and I feel I'm an intuitive, so I'm not necessarily it doesn't require for me to be, 
I guess, mechanical because I'm intuitive anyway. So 98% of the way I create is by how I feel. I feel that thing. I feel that string. I feel that drum. I feel that, you know, so no, it, it, it doesn't get in the way. That's really fascinating. Um, Follow-up question. Uh, is there an instrument that you would like to learn? Um, and what is it? At this point, no, because I think I would be going backwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I, if right now, it's speaking for me, if I, 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 I once had, I'm going to tell you, and I had to learn this. There was a music teacher who I, she was, she was my music teacher. She was also, my, she's also one of my mother's childhood friends. She graduated from Juilliard. And I remember wanting to take piano lessons from her. And she said to me, she's like, I'm not going to teach you. And this is when I was, I had made the music for Rick Owens' show. I remember specifically asking her, once I come back from Paris, can you teach me how to play the piano? And she said, no. And I said, why not? She said, because I'd be undoing everything that you are right now. And at first it hurt my feelings, but then I had to understand what she was saying. She said, you have everything you need plus. She said, I would undo that if I taught you how to play at this point. So no, I, I wouldn't want to. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, another question I had, uh, I know you talked about your journey and I think your, your journey into like your music career was really inspiring. Um, if there is a message that you can give to, I guess like college students right now, what would it be? Um, that you could do whatever you prepare for. And it's okay if you fall 18 times, it's totally fine because you're not falling. That's the thing, you're not falling. You have to go through the process of where you, you see the other side, you know what you, excuse me, you know what your goal is, you see the other side, but you have to embrace the process of what you're gonna go through because that is gonna teach you what to do and what not to do. And you have to embrace the process. Is it frustrating? Absolutely. And does it stop? Absolutely not. <laughs> it's just you you are evolving to become your best self and you have to go through every stage of it. And sometimes it's beautiful and sometimes it is a pain and sometimes it is like dreadful birth that is just like being in labor for out for just ridiculous amounts of hours, but then the baby's born and it's beautiful. But go through the process because it is, it's, it's so beautiful to get there. Just like it is, you know, when you, the, the diamond's beautiful, but the pressure is, is vital because it doesn't become a diamond if there is no pressure. So embrace it because you're going to need it and to get to where you want to go. And don't, you know, don't hate it. It's making you better, even if you can't see it and you're frustrated as hell. I, I get it. Believe me, I do. But keep going. That's awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, I think we are on to the next uh, graduate student question. Uh, Vivek Menon has a question for you. Go ahead, Vivek, and unmute yourself. Hey, um, yeah, I'm super excited to be able to have you here and ask you questions. Uh, I, I remember um, uh, listening to Dark Energy like back when I first started college and it put me onto a lot of um, more experimental electronic music. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to ju just like, I, I like have dabbled a little bit in electronic music of uh, production, but uh, I never re really stuck with it. I was just curious uh, what, uh, what, like DAW you use, or if you use like um, uh, multiple ones and like why you use the one that you use. Okay, so I use FL Studio mm -hmm. uh, predominantly. Um, I do know how to use Reasons um, and I, I do know how to use Pro Tools, but I prefer, definitely prefer hands down mm -hmm. um, FL Studio. I, um, I find it to be a lot, the flexibility that I need is there. I 
so funny because I have heard other music companies say that we're still trying to get to the flexibility of FL Studio. <laughs> <laughs> I kid you not. Like they're like, we're still, we're still working on it. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so, but it does, it provides me with just the, yeah, the flexibility I need for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So kind of like going off of that, when when you're when you're like about to start work on a new track in FL mm -hmm. Studio, uh, do, do you have like a specific uh, like is the first thing in your mind like a, a, like an idea for like a drum pattern or do you have like a sample or something in mind that you want to chop up first? No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> uh -uh. Um, I don't even MIDI myself <laughs> from old <laughs> projects. So no, there's nothing ever made. When I start, it's all new. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's nothing that's pre-made that's like, let me, and there's nothing wrong with that. I right, right. take no, yeah. But for me, the way that I work, it, that doesn't work for me because I feel mm -hmm. like every piece that I make has to have its own room to develop. Mm -hmm. So if I... I feel like if I were to do it, I would kind of choke it out. So right. I wouldn't, yeah, I, I no, I, I want that thing, you know, that likes like, you know, those are my kids. So I, you know, they have to grow, you know, right. And yeah. They're their own people. So that's the way I treat the, you know, the music's mm -hmm. the same. Yeah. Interesting. Is there generally a place that like, like, so uh, um, you're saying you don't have any like pre-made things when you like, start on like a track mm -hmm. is, is there typically like when you're about to start do you is is there like a general place that you begin from like uh, do you start like uh thinking about like drum patterns first or do you think about like mm -mm. The other elements first or does it kind of just like a depend no, it's literally like okay so sit down the computer open up fl new project, select mm -hmm. new project. And then of course I have my list on my left-hand side, uh, menu of all of the sounds that I have, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So then there's that, and then it's like, okay, go through, play with, you know, listen to these, you know, so you're clicking, do, 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 do. It has, you know, yeah. all those different, yeah, right. that's, yeah, that's, so it, it, a track can start like that. It's, I haven't done a track like that in a long time, but mm -hmm. usually for me, it's more like, if I'm going through like a particular like sound. Am I in Omnisphere? Am I in Serum? Am I in, um, uh, let me see, where's, where's another one that I use? Um, God, I can't think of it right now. I have a lot of stuff. So it's mm. just like, you know, it just, what what is that sound? What is that sound telling me? Or why did that sound make me feel that way? And it's like, I ooh, I like that. Let me see where that goes. What is that? Okay. Yeah, it's like, that's for me. It, it, it's like that, you know, because every everything, all my music kind of tells me what to do. <laughs> so it kind of is like, you know, it's like, okay, we trust you. So there's a sound. So here's a sound to say it's coming out of Omnisphere. And it's like, okay, Jalen, we trust you now. Now, what are you going to do with us? And then it's like uh, that. Yeah. You know, e yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you uh, so much for. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have a question or a two-part question, and then, I'm, then we're going to open it up to any of the uh, other 109 and 536 students who might want to ask a question, and then if there's time at the end, we'll open it up to uh, the rest of the room. Um, so my two questions first are, where does dance fit into your compositional process? Like, do you dance to, uh, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. Um, where does it fit in? And the second question is, where do you see your work fitting into the bigger history of house music? Um, you know, people, obviously, the commentators see or hear your work in relation to house. And I'm curious about where you see and hear your work in relation to house. I don't. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. But um, at least I don't. I No, I don't. I don't see it at all. I, um, but as far as dance movement and dance well movement period is everything you know do i dance no um but i can see dances in my head and create from that space um i literally there's a piece that um a, a choreographer uh, kyle abraham i had done for it was really I, it was just i really just wanted him to hear it and he was like, 
yeah, uh, save this for me. <laughs> like, save this for me. Like, specifically for me, because that's crazy. Like, you know what I just heard. And so I, I, it's not that I ever have a particular dance or dancer or whatever, but I do. Dance definitely does influence my music. I love movement because it doesn't even have to be like a dance. Like this is, you know, it just, I love movement from the way, sometimes that the way that a, that a, somebody moves their arm to the way that they blink to, you know, that kind of a thing. Like it doesn't have to be like just dance, but yeah, dance is, it's, 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 it's definitely, it's great, but I can definitely just have just certain things of like the way a person, you know, shifts their body or just things like that can inspire me for sure. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, so I open it up now to any of the 109 or 536 students who have a question. You can go ahead and maybe put it in the chat would be the easiest way to do it. And we can mm -hmm. um, ask them in order. I'll ask a question while we're waiting for things to come in. So um, as part of our preparation for uh, in studying your, your music um, and following up some of your inspirations, we, we listened to uh, Sade. And I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit more about what it was that was inspiring to you. Because I mean, you know, the first thing, that, at least for me, that comes to mind is this kind of vocal quality and in her music, right? And the, the kind of sound that's there. But but going back to it, I discovered there were all these rhythmic things going on underneath it. So I'm just wondering, what, what it, was it the rhythmic things that were going on or was it something about the, the vocal quality or the kind of overall vibe or what was it? It's both because Sade can also sing against the music as well. And I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think anybody's ever noticed that Sade can. The fact that she can sing against her band and it still flows is brilliant. And then the fact that she can sing with the band and it still flows is brilliant. And the rhythms that are going behind, for example, um, one of my fa my my favorite, not to say it's one of them, is um, "Slave Song" by Sade. And the percussion in Slave Song is, oh man, like it's just phenomenal. And then it can go from something like that to Love is Stronger Than Pride, that percussion. It took me years to realize I had to watch a concert, how to, I'm like, how is, how are they making the drum sound so deep but muffled at the same time? It was so fascinating to me. And then I realized how he was doing it. I said, oh, okay. Like he has, he had to muffle muffled the stick basically to then hit and then I forgot what it was the way he would hit the the bass drum but it was that's it was crazy forever. <laughs> <laughs> sorry my mom was listening to she loves Sade so she was like tell and her I know Trev the, the, the drummer who did on that album his name is Trevor Morrell okay she knows him pretty well so okay she, like I love that song too yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, she was like, "Tell her, tell her, I love this song." Oh, so I'm, I'm so sorry. I was gonna tell no. you. She, she just like, sorry, everyone. No, I think that's no. Please tell your mom. She just made this whole thing great. Like for real. She, she can hear you <laughs> in the back. Thank you, mom. <laughs> sorry about that, everyone. I apologize. No, mothers are so important. Like they are the jewels of life. So no, no, seriously, like I'm not just saying that to be funny, like no apology for real. Like don't know. I'm so happy that that's that's why they're mothers, because they know what we don't. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, mom. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm a fan of uh, Sade as well. And I, I listen to her as well. So, yeah, I, I understand. Yeah. She's so ahead of her time. Yeah, she is. Yeah, they they they're they're just as a, as a whole front. They're but her she and the band they're just so ahead of the time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean like no ordinary love is one of my favorites. Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah. Me with me with music, it's the way it makes me feel, and yes. I just I feel so calm. It's like it's like I'm in another world. So yeah. Yeah. Really exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Okay, we got a bunch of questions here. Um, maybe I'll do some in order. Um, so Vivek wants to know, and I want to say that Vivek is 
representing both classes. He's a, he's one oh, of my wow. teaching assistants, and okay. he's also wow. in in Ben's class. So okay. he wants to know uh, if there are any projects that came out so far in 2021 that stood out to you or inspired you. So recent things. Uh, ooh, you know, to be honest with you, um, that inspired me for 2021. 2021 is pretty young still. Yes, but I have no idea. No, like right now, <laughs> I have no idea what's happening musically, um, which is so bad. But I'm I'm willing to say that in front of 94 people right now, I have no idea what's happening musically right now. Not a clue. I'm so sorry I don't, but I really don't. <laughs> um, so Rubens, do you want to just ask your question? Sure. Um, I have a question, Jaylene, regarding um, um, melody and the absence of melody that I read in another interview that uh, your music does not rely on melody and instead relies on, on the absence of melody. First, how do you organize your music um, hier hierarchically? Does he have a um, hierarchy as compared to uh, the me melody, harmony, rhythm that other composers take as uh, their basis? Uh, and second, um, we would love to hear more about this absence of melody as a compositional tool, as a compositional concept. Okay, yeah, well, I'm not, th okay, there you, you actually just kind of touch the answer. I'm never looking for a concept. I'm just going because I'm in, I'm more intuitive. I, it's not that I'm, you know, like, it's not even a thing of like absence of melody. It's not or intention of, you know, there's an intention, at least it, it, it's not for me now. It may have been back then. I don't know. I'm, yeah, it may have been back then a thing for me. But right now, it's, it's, it's not intentional. It's just, mm -hmm. um, it's just I create from what I feel and where I am. So I'm, I'm, it, it, it's, it's never, for me, I love abstract versus conceptual. Mm -hmm. A lot of people ask me, like, is your work, is this conceptual or is it, is it abstract? And I'm like, I probably, I would think it would be more abstract than it is conceptual because I don't really, I never have a concept. It's just kind of, it, it creates itself, you know, and like I said, the sounds tell me what to do. I just roll with that. And then we work together and somehow there's an end product. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I don't have a really like, Usually when you know you get asked a question like that or some everybody's like looking for like this extremely deep answer and I'm like, I don't have a deep answer. <laughs> that's great. That's, <laughs> that's good. Thank you. Thank you. So Christian Clark writes this, uh, when you first wanted to be an artist, where did you start? Meaning what gigs or producers or singers did you aim to see and goals did you aim to reach? The first concert I ever went to was my own. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah the first literally like yeah the first concert i had ever been to in the history of my life was my own um which was i don't even know if that's a thing but yeah it was because i never and i didn't i didn't meet artists until i started performing i never had met any musical artists outside of um like it's in my in my genre until i started performing but um I will say that at one time I was, I was in the process of, yeah, I forgot about this part. Um, it was a question from earlier, but kind of relates to this. I was in the process of learning how to, I only took like two drum lessons, but the person who was teaching me how to play the drums was um, Johnny Jackson, who was the drummer for Jackson 5. Mm. Um, and it, I remember him telling, you know, just telling me what I needed and he was showing me how to, what, you know, what pair, pair diddles were and, I still have the piece of paper that he wrote them down on um, to, that he gave to me. And then, you know, like he, he passed away and, um, you know, it was just, he was actually in my neighbor's band. Um, he was their drummer at the time is, and, um, and Gary, they would go throughout Gary and do like all the, like, kind of like the major events in the city and um, perform. But I remember I recall like one of the things that just stick out for me, like I, I love, I don't, I know, I just, I just, I, I, I love percussion. I do. But then there's just something about 
the, the sound of the string, like the violin, the viola, and the cello, and just that do it for me too. Um, and they're, they have such a pre different type of boldness of a presence, in, you know, music wise to me. And, you know, I just, they do, they just, it's just it, they're their own thing, like my goodness. Um, which is why I can never tie together. Like when I, if, if, if I had to write for like an orchestra, like I can never just say everybody's thrown into the same group because every every section and every single instrument has their own personality because everybody playing is a different individual. So I always, you know, I think about musically even when I'm creating um, like that as well. Like when I'm creating something that, you know, that everything has its own personality and they all have a voice and everybody wants to speak and, you know, let's bring that out. Like I always just try, if, if I'm writing, that's what I'm always trying to do. Let me bring out the, the personality and the sound of everybody because everybody has a voice. And I see instruments, when I say everybody, I mean, the, you know, the instrumentation because I see instruments like people too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Owen Lures writes, is there a difference between you being proud of work of your work and you understanding that you have your signature on your work the being proud is pride can get you in trouble pride can get you in trouble being proud of myself yeah i'm proud of myself but i always when i take on a project it's like i've never done anything before this is my first shot every time. So every time I make a song, it's my first shot every time. So when I go and I'm thinking about it in terms of signature, signature is, that's ever evolving. That's an evolving thing. You you find your signature so now you can evolve into where you're supposed to be. You know, the, the finding the signature part isn't the, the finish, that's the start for me. So then when it's time to do a project now, and then I'm like, I'm proud, but like, I feel like I, I told I respect Shaka Khan so much for saying, what the hell is 26 Grammys? I, what is that? <laughs> like, who cares? Like, none of that matters. That's the way I feel. Like, and all of these accolades, am I grateful for them? Of course. But do, but when I'm starting a project, nobody cares about any of that. No, not, especially not me. Like, no, no one cares. Like, great, wonderful. Woo, woo, woo. But yeah, that's, that has nothing to do with where are you going though? That's the thing you did in the past. What's happening right now? Yeah. So <laughs> we have to deal with that part. <laughs> Mel Melody's giving me a cue about what we need to teach in class next week. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I wrote it in the chat. I love Shaquan. I saw. Oh my goodness. I'll She's I'll one of my that. favorite artists. <laughs> me too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. That's right. My mom and I just, we saw her in concert like two years ago in Connecticut. Oh that was God. like the best concerts I've ever been to. Oh, I can only imagine. It was amazing. I can only imagine. Ben's going to uh, take one. Yeah, so we have about five minutes left, so I was going to let, uh, and I saw Empress Mena and Barbell has a question in the chat, um, which if you want to unmute yourself and ask, you can do, or we can just read it straight from the chat if you prefer. Up to you. Uh, their question is, what's next for you musically, which feels like a very good place to uh, to to end the conversation. Yeah, it is. That's a very good place to end the conversation. Um, I'm in the, like, not to go into great, I'm, I'm in the middle of a transition right now. Um, and this is one of, this goes back to having the answer, but I, I have to figure out the question. So musically, so what the, to, to translate that, um, I don't know, but I love that I don't know. But do I know I'm going somewhere? Absolutely. I feel it. And that's good enough for me. I know I'm definitely going. I just don't know where. But I love that I don't know. That's the beauty for me of, of art on a whole front is I don't know. And I don't have the control over it. Um, so as far as I'm, I'm talking about not in business decisions, I mean, like as far as 
the overall universal where where am I going I don't I don't know because I'm still just like from everybody else I have to I'm in the process of the having to reinvent readjust to every you know with COVID happening and everything but rest assured I am finally going to work on the album that has been tapping me from the inside out and I'm finally going to do it so that is the third album that I'm going to you know work on I'm not I, I may I'm not gonna you know may not take it on like immediately but I definitely know the one that has me the most afraid and apprehensive is the one I need to work on well we actually do have a couple we have three more minutes so and there's a really good question sorry for the false ending there but Nicholas Lyons has a really great question in the chat mm. um, asking for advice for uh, creating as a music major and I mm. To imagine that there are so many people right now who would just find your answer so valuable so i do want to pose this this one last question okay C creating wait what was it creating musically yeah let me read the whole question you talk okay. about the process of finding your signature and trusting mm. yourself what advice do you have for creating as a music major in a school system and trusting and investing in your own ideas visions and goals okay I do not want to get anyone in trouble when I make this, when I say this. <laughs> um, if it were me as the person now, because sometimes just because your teacher or your professor does not see it or hear it or thinks it sounds insane, doesn't mean that it's wrong. Because music doesn't, there is no right or wrong answer musically. So as a music major, if, if, if I were a music major and I was in school, I wouldn't think of, because I wouldn't think about it in terms of, is this right or wrong? Or is this going to give me a good grade or a bad grade? Um, I would think about it in the terms of, because you may have, I, honestly, oh my God, you might have a teacher that completely just flunks you out because it's just, they're like, I just, I don't understand. This isn't what I'm looking for. You know, it may not be what they're looking for. It doesn't make it wrong. It doesn't make it, um, and it doesn't, unfortunately, as hard as that is to say, the most important validation, and that's with anyone, is your own. Even in school, I have to say, I, it, because if you lose that, it's to lose your signature. That is to lose your signature. If your, if that person, if, if my mother was a professor and she was, the, she's the, the dean of music, right? If she said to me, you know, Geraldine, hey, I guess I use my government for that one because that she, it took her, it took her a long time to adapt to Jalen. It really did. It was actually funny, but she, you know, if if she didn't understand. You know, and she was just like, I can't grade this. That doesn't make it what I did wrong. So as a music major, trust you. Because if you don't trust you, you don't find your signature. Your signature is a part of your trust. It is a pact that nobody can take from you. I don't care how crazy it sounds. Hell, I may not get it. And that, you know, that's fine. But it's yours. And if you want to mold that trust that forget the forget you know don't get me wrong you know for kind of the institution part of it it's don't get you you definitely you learn absolutely of course of course of course you do but if it comes to the point you don't sell your signature. You just don't, don't, I, I wouldn't sell out to me. I would rather, I'm gonna be honest with you, it's just sound to be so bad, but I would rather be true to myself than to a lot someone else to define how I should sound. I just, I can't, but, and, and the reason I, I can confidently say that is because that's how I got to this point, being authentically me. And I'm telling that to you. And if, whether you are a professor, the dean of students, a, a, a student, you know, that this is your major. Being authentically you and being true to yourself is everything. It, it's, it's everything. And don't lose that, not for anybody. 
I mean, just don't lose that because you, you sell yourself short because trying to satisfy either society or being in an institution. You don't sell yourself short. You don't get to be, somebody just mentioned Alicia Keys. You don't get to be an Alicia Keys. Sometimes you, when everybody else is like, I don't get it. A lot of people don't get Sade. It didn't get Sade in 1984 either, but look at Sade. You know, look at same thing. Like I, I told the story about Beyonce, you know, uh, this record's not going to sell. She went six times platinum. I mean, it, yay. Some, sometimes you got to trust you and roll the dice. You got to trust you and roll the dice. And that's, I know that's hard. I know it's hard. Um, but you got to trust you and roll the dice. And if I think if more people thought that way, I think we'd have a lot more of authenticity across the board artistically, you know, you, you don't get to be, you know, the, 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 De the Debbie Allens and Al Alvin Ailey's because you, they took the risk that you got to, you, sometimes you just got to take the risk where you just like, it's not to say I'm a, you're above learning. It's not that, but when you know in your heart of hearts that you, this is your signature and you have made a, you know, you make the pack with yourself and nobody can take that from you. And you don't let anybody take that from you. You just don't. Mm -mm. Thank you, Jalen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You uh, let's, uh, let's, let's all give a well-deserved round of applause to Jalen for joining us. Mm. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you all for being. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thanks thank everybody you for coming. Um, yes. And Jalen, if you maybe just stay on for a little bit, we'll sure. talk a little bit. Sure, sure, sure. Toward the end of this. Thank, thank you for, for sharing your wisdom, Jalen, and us, oh, thank you know, you. for being part of our institute today. Thank you. And we really enjoyed, and your generosity was really appreciated. Oh, thank you. Thank you all, too. I'm so, thank you, truly. Everybody that took the time out, I, I'm so humbled, really. Thank you. And the questions were, um, wow, wow, well, very well thought out. Everybody's question was well thought out. And so thank you for that. Because let me tell you, as an artist, we get tired of getting the same questions. 